In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Astonished is the only word to describe how I felt when I read a headline last week. I even had to check multiple times to see if in fact it was true and if I believed my eyes were being truthful to me. Now, let's pause for a moment. It was cold this morning, am I right? Well, the headline read this, Watch out, be careful for falling iguanas in South Florida. It's so cold in Miami that iguanas are entering a tonic state and falling from the trees onto unsuspecting joggers on the sidewalks below. Now, folks, that's cold. (laughs) The gospel lesson this morning, the people in the synagogue are cold to Jesus. But it doesn't start out that way. Did you notice that in the reading? They start out excited. They're sitting in their chairs. They are anticipating hearing God's Word from this local carpenter. So they sit in their chairs, perhaps chairs that the local carpenter or his son made with their own hands for the synagogue. And then Jesus stands and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. Reverend Lydia preached that passage last week where Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim freedom to those who are imprisoned. And the Spirit of the Lord has told me to mend the brokenhearted, to give sight to the blind, and to proclaim the year of God's reign. Now in the first century... The Jewish custom was to read standing and then sit to teach or preach from a chair. Maybe Jesus made that chair. But Luke says that Jesus, like many seminarians, his first sermon begins good and then seems to peter off down toward the end. He begins with God being very exclusive. An exclusive blessing for a small group of people within a particular geographical boundary. And the parishioners, they are excited to hear this. They're they're in the warm weather. They think it means that God will come in and smash the evil Roman occupation, all of their leaders and all of their soldiers, and God will reign again in Israel. This is their prayer. And when Jesus reads that passage from Isaiah, the room is electric and people begin to whisper, even among themselves, is this Joseph's son? Is this the same man who grew up here with us? What has happened to him? God's anointing is strong with him. Could it be that he is the one Isaiah prophesied about? But when Jesus changed the temperature in the room uh, toward God's inclusion of a leper and a widow, uh, things began to shift and the mood went in a different direction. He goes from admired preacher to heretic at a moment's notice. Jesus progresses through these characters in the Old Testament. And it's really like a, the sermon's like a Clint Eastwood film. It goes from good to bad to ugly really quickly. And then Jesus provokes the congregation with this heinous interpretation. He says this, there is a wideness in God's warm mercies. He chooses two of the most revered prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures to illustrate that God is not bound by boundaries. Now in those days, a lot, well, in Jesus' days, the most revered prophets from hundreds of years before, two of them were Elijah the prophet and Elisha his Padawan. Prophets of the old republic, as it were. 
Elijah fed a widow during a years-long drought, but she wasn't Jewish. She was from a different country, a Gentile person. And then during the Syrian occupation, Elisha uh, heals Naaman, a man with leprosy, by telling him to go jump in the river. Well, if I knew that would work, I would try it every once in a while. But that is the final straw. He has talked about God's inclusion of a widow, a powerless person, and a man of great authority commanding an army. He takes the full gamut, puts it all together, and says, that is the wideness of God's mercy. And for the folks in the synagogue that day, that was the final straw. And they seize him and they head on their way out to the cliffs. Now, hold the spot. Iguanas101.com says, and I quote, If an iguana has not been worked with, it will often become and stay unwelcoming and aggressive towards others. Always think of an iguana as a nervous person trying to survive in the world. They have a strong, and all of that was capitalized, they have a strong sense of self-defense. Jesus says it this way, God's inclusion extends beyond the state lines and the national boundaries and the ones, even the theological ones that we draw around ourselves, and it includes love to a powerless pagan widow and the general of the occupying forces of the Syrian army. Thank you. Amen. Inclusion and embrace is difficult, even for us. We've all been there personally, am I right? We've been there as a church, a denomination. If you want to freeze an iguana, change the liturgy. Oh, it's quiet in the church now. A cold front swept through the Episcopal church and people froze in the state, in the tree, and fell to the sidewalk when we changed two simple words in the liturgy and molded them into one word. It's in your bulletin. You'll see it in a few minutes. You'll hear me say it. At one point, you'll be able to read it with us Jesus, the liturgy said at one point, this is my blood that is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And now it reads, this is my blood which is shed for you and for all for the remission of sins. Not long ago, I was catching up with a friend, happens to be a bishop, and he was laughing with me and he told me about a three-page letter he received from someone that centered on these two words, for many. And this particular iguana was rather cold to the bishop. The mystery writer, because he didn't have the courage to sign it, the mystery writer noted various theological and liturgical reasons why all should not be in the Eucharistic prayer and that we need, we must return to the old ways of doing things in the Episcopal church. The bottom line there is this, all was just too inclusive and it was too far outside of the boundaries. Now, our denomination has problems and struggles, but I'm proud of us in many ways. Because we have challenged at times our own cold-heartedness and our own prejudice. Women are now ordained in ministry in our church. Reverend Lydia preached here last week. We celebrated the Eucharist together. The invitation now is that all are welcome to the Lord's table. All are loved and included, gay or straight, in God's house. 
There are times when we've gotten it wrong and we have been the frozen chosen. But I'm proud of the way that we can lean forward and question those cold moments and say, is this really God's will for us to freeze into a tonic state and fall from our tree? See, the call, I believe, is right here in the gospel for us. And that is, it is important that we know when it is time to walk away from our cold-heartedness and the cold-heartedness of others. Let's look at that gospel lesson here again. It's the, the, the people in the synagogue are so cold and they're so unbending in their anger. And then it turns to rage and a mob decides to drag Jesus out of the building and pull him toward the cliffs of Nazareth and hurl him to his death. They are so cold that they are willing to fall from a position of God's mercy and grace to the point of throwing Jesus over the cliff for proclaiming God's warm welcome. And this is where Luke enlightens us with a mind-blowing truth. Jesus escaped that exclusion. Luke says, but he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Now, I think there is a great life lesson from this reading this morning. There are many times, you've experienced it and I have too, where people might criticize our compassion, or our convictions, or our callings. They might say that who we, are, who we are, what we have done, the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the houses and the zip codes where we live, it is wrong. Can I share something that I've learned over the years? There will always be that one person who says that Mary wasted the anointing oil that costs so much on Jesus. There will always be someone who criticizes the way of Jesus' tunic that was so expensive that the soldiers wouldn't even rip it in pieces. There will always be people who criticize us. It's not fair, they say. It's wasteful. Their grace, their inclusion, the doors are too wide open. And God just does not work that way. Well, I love what Luke says here. He says, Jesus walked through the midst of all of that and he went on his way. Amen. They went on his way. That's a message we need to hear if at any point these days. You know, one badge of honor that I, I do wear is that I made it into a local pastor's sermon not too long ago, and he was a good old cold boy. Because the inclusion that we preach and we believe at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church was just too wide for him, and we were sinners, we were an abomination because of the people we welcome and the partnerships that we have formed on our campus and in the community. We are worthy of the cliffs. And I heard it, and I rewinded it, and I called my wife, and we laughed together. And then, just like Jesus, I went on my way. Sermon title this morning is to know when to go on your way. You know, you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. You've got to know when to walk away. Help me. You've got to know when to run. 